Welcome, uh, Jack Diamond, the creative force uh, behind uh, this Osgood project and, uh, of course, of uh, DSAI, Diamond uh, Schmidt Architects Incorporated. And uh, this project um, uh, predates uh, my time as Dean at Osgood, and uh, Jack Diamond has seen it through from the very outset. So we wanted to take this opportunity on this um, day, October 16th, 2011, when we're welcoming back our alumni and our community to celebrate this remarkable building, to reflect a little bit on the thinking behind it, the right. process of uh, designing what it would be and incorporating uh, the building that uh, existed from 1968 uh, until now. And so maybe, uh, Jack, if we can begin just with uh, your own thought process. What was the first reaction you had to walking through this building as you were introduced uh, to the project of reinventing it? Well, of course, uh, it's the product of a long process, as you say. And I think that the interesting part about it is that we set out, first of all, by not putting any position forward. We had, uh, what I like to do is to divide the client's interest groups into coherent and homogeneous groupings, taking a leaf out of the uh, book of the advertising industry and like a focus group, but not to produce a product, but to really get out to what people care about what works and what doesn't work. And there were some very prevalent thoughts that came through, a fairly consistent response. I think um, one was lack of daylight, natural light. Right. One of them was the kind of incoherence of the building. You didn't know where people were. You had no idea about this. You, unless you had an event such as sitting in the staircase, there really wasn't a a way in which the community as a whole, Osgood as an institution, was uh, uh, comprehended. And I think that there was also a sense that it didn't have a mark on the campus. I mean, these are some broad brush strokes, but we got a lot of information out of it. I mean, the, the student center was, you know, basement of the worst kind. Um, the facing south over a beautiful woodlot wasn't taken advantage of. There was no sense of entry. And Osgood, in a way, who, that has this stunning tradition of Osgood Hall, had no reflection in the building of that history. So in light of that, and in light of Osgood's, um, uh, of course, historic connections to the uh, Law Society building at Queen and University, uh, one option could have been to try to build in more of those gargoyles and cornices and features from that building, which is, of course, uh, lovely in its own right. And that clearly wasn't the direction uh, that you went here with the opportunity to build new spaces. And, and obviously the uh, glass and light is a sharp contrast uh, to the uh, brick, but also something that appears much more forward looking. What, what lay behind that? It was a good building in its own right. I, I lay a great deal of store by authenticity. It's not to be imitative of another time that you design for your own time with new the technology you have at hand, but also with the sensibilities of the users. And I think that what we got out of all of those sessions with the users is that the lack of natural light was critical, that the building had no connection to the past or to have some connection to the past if it wasn't merely being a replica, and replicas are never as good as the original. So I think that the introduction of natural light and using uh, wood as one of the linkages between the paneling and the form of an old court or an old Osgood Hall and a contemporary building, but done in, an, in a contemporary way. So the principles are the same um, of creating a good environment, but expressively it's quite different because of our time, our sensibilities. And I think that the users care more about the working environment than they used to. I think while they once accepted the sort of grandeur of that kind of a place, it's less important now. What you want is natural light. You want a good office. You want good amenity. You want Wi-Fi. Uh, you want to have a decent cafeteria. All those kinds of things about where you work and the kind of life that people lead now is somewhat different. That's right. I think the virtual uh, law school is something that, uh, as a community, we right. grapple with because we want to uh, embrace and embody uh, that kind of forward-looking way of uh, understanding legal education. The building is, of course, uh, wired for the future, but you're absolutely right. Finding the reasons to come together is essential to building a community. And so that brings me to some of the signature 
spaces, and uh, in particular what is now uh, Gowling's Hall, the Galleria that um, uh, reflects the brand new space, uh, and of course the most visually uh, striking uh, in, in my own view. Uh, was that planned with a response to this kind of uh, issue in mind? Exactly. It speaks to the issue about the silos. What we wanted to do was to have access to all of the significant components of the building off that one space. That when passing, going to the JCR at the end, it's a, I mean to use a very poor analogy, it's the way in which the items you really want at a supermarket at the back of the store and the impulse buying is on the way. Right. So what you want to do is to draw students through the, and they are conscious of events in the library or in the moot court or in the uh, in the, the, the special components all the way down the gallery, and they can see whose light is on in the offices of the faculty above. So the issue about this being a visual but much more um, a real connector, um, that this is a uni unifying piece, it's you gain access to everywhere from that, and of course it admits you know, enormous amounts of natural like. No, the first time I toured the construction site and had to bring sunglasses uh, was a revelation <laughs> as someone who attended uh, Osgood in uh, the years where it was uh, uninterrupted brick walls. But, but I guess that's the other uh, dimension I was hoping to get your reflection on. Uh, continuity is such an important part of uh, school with this kind of legacy. And of course, the decision was uh, not to raise uh, the old building in, in the end and to uh, build uh, in it, around it, um, beside it. And so how did you approach continuity and, and some relationship between the old and the new? Right. Well, in fact, the Galleria is the connector. It's both a divider and a connector. I mean, it's something where you gain access to everything. But in order to, it actually makes structural sense. The building that was built you know, when it was in the 60s, um, techn technically we have advanced so since then in the in construction in the building world and so in a way the new building doesn't touch the old building there's this delicate connection of the glass roof between the two but we didn't disturb the foundations we built on a new piece of land so to speak although it had its own problems because of the underground accommodation that was there and so forth but the fact of the matter is it's almost an independent piece and then linking the two so that you had continuity of no compromise on the contemporary tradition whatsoever, and then modifications to the old and then connecting them with the Galleria. So the Galleria is a connector in more, in a very real sense. So in those old um, uh, structures in the Law Society, of course, is a particular uh, example mm. of it. People often refer to uh, the building itself having uh, personality, not just being a collection of wood or brick or stone. Correct. <clears throat> uh, and do you, uh, do you see personalities in buildings? Did you see a, a personality in this one? And, uh, Absolutely. Um, I think that the accessibility that this building creates that the old one did not. And even Osgood Hall originally, I mean, these are rooms that are tucked away with a big door, and quite intimidatingly so. And I think the opposite is true here. And that's another real difference, the kind of hierarchical sense of the profession then, and the way in which the formality of, our, of the meeting then as opposed to the informality now and the accessibility required. Can you imagine someone in the 18th century calling their professor by their first name? Impossible, but it, it occurs now. And so there's a major difference. And so the personality of the building is very much one in which is consistent with the way in which we conduct our lives. Uh, so it leads to a, uh, what's always a delicate question to an architect. Uh, many of us, and you noted this in your first remarks, reflect on that original building from 1968 right. and its uh, great ambitions, but unfulfilled in many respects of um, uh, a learning environment that put students first and, and connected those elements you mentioned. So uh, put yourself ahead the next 40 years. Yes. Uh, the people who are gonna look back on this building, and I hope it, it endures even uh, longer in its uh, wonderful state. Uh, what? What do you think they're going to say, reflecting back on, on this era, and, and again, assuming things will change and new styles and designs will come, uh, what, what would you say to capture the ambition or the aspiration of this building? I think that one of the problems for the, architect, uh, the architects in the 60s and 70s was that they were physically deter physical determinists. They thought that if you labeled a space meeting room, people would meet there. 
Uh, in fact, it was usually the opposite. I mean, I give the example often of a, uh, my experience of a, a university corridor in a dormitory or in a residential building. And the meeting room's at the end. It's empty. Somebody's small room is jammed with people. Why is that? Well, people walking by and the door is open, there's a social circumstance that looks congenial. They don't want to look like they're looking for friendship. They've got their books under their arm off the library. But there's a group and you can stop by and it happens so that people begin to use the building in a way that is uh, evocative of the forms but not predetermined by the architect. And the classic example of that here, of course, was the mixing area in which no one could really mix. Precisely. Because there were stairwells going off in every direction. So we've made a series of little spaces, the lounge over the entry, JCR at the end, and then the, the, the benches and so forth in the Galleria. My sense is that it's going to be interesting to see, having offered these, made these gestures, to make it easy to gather and talk and get together, whether that in fact happens. So uh, and that's really the last question I wanted to put to you. How, how do you measure success as an architect, apart from presumably being Doesn't relieved leak. that it gets built, exactly, yeah. <laughs> and there's no leaks, and it's still standing, and of course uh, uh, it came in on budget, on, on time, and, and we're enormously proud uh, that we were able to come back into it uh, August 2011, as we had promised, and as uh, you and, and those who are building it had committed. But as you're going to walk through the building today, as you come, we hope often to drop by and see the students, staff, faculty, the whole community uh, living in it. Uh, what, what do you look for? What's going to be the uh, measure of success for you? Well, in a way, uh, my son, who's a graduate of this, an alumnus, I mean, he'll be able to be in a better position to tell me what it was like then and what it's like now, because I wasn't a student here. But I think that if indeed people spend more time here, that they collaborate. I mean, the collaboration is also a, one of the absolutely imperatives of any successful institution. Teamwork, how that works, whether the building actually is instrumental in, in fostering these kinds of activity, these kinds of uh, drivers, that will be the success, that people actually want to spend more time here, that they actually do get together, they actually enjoy working here or going to the library or meeting friends, that will be the ultimate success. To me, that's the real success, not the critics' view of drive-by critics who look at the building and talk about it as an object. But it's the experiential question that will be the success or failure of the building. Well, I want to say on behalf of uh, the OSGA community, thank you, and especially thank you for uh, sharing your views. And it's not just uh, through your son that you're part of the Osgood family. You're now uh, an extended um, element that makes us who we are and uh, we couldn't be uh, prouder to be uh, living uh, in uh, what was an extraordinary vision and uh, we hope a living one as uh, we move forward. So thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you.